Between 1930 and 1953, according to NKVD's own reports, more than a million six hundred thousand people perished in Soviet labor camps more commonly known as the gulags. These were also the years when Joseph Stalin ruled the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, also known as the Soviet Union, with an iron fist. His reign of terror wasn't just about taking people's lives, but doing it slowly, perversely, and as excruciatingly as possible. Welcome to Nutty History, and today let's find out what punishment methods were employed by Joseph Stalin's regime. The Gulag was first established in 1919, and by 1921 the system had 84 camps. But it wasn't until Stalin's rule that the prison population reached significant numbers. Anyone who had ties to disloyal anti-Stalinists could be imprisoned. Even women and children endured the harsh conditions of the camps. Camp prisoners often drudged through brutal weather, sometimes facing sub-zero temperatures. Food rations were tight and work days were long. If prisoners didn't complete their work quotas, they received less food. They were also given crude, simple tools and no safety equipment. Some workers spent their days cutting down trees or digging at the frozen ground with hand saws and pickaxes. Others mined coal or copper, and many had to dig up dirt with their bare hands. But this was only the standard procedure of their work life in the Gulag. The Gulag's living conditions were cold, overcrowded, and unsanitary. Violence was common among the camp inmates, who were made up of both hardened criminals and political prisoners. More often than not, this integration of various prisoners caused friction in the camps, both at the canteen or at the table playing cards. Gulag authorities had a fetish for deploying their guerrilla justice on these insolent inmates. Such prisoners were stripped down and dragged out in the snow with their limbs bound together so they could only crawl like a caterpillar to die a slow pain from hyperthermia. But for some reason, the sub-zero conditions were not tormenting enough for Gulag authorities and they wanted to prolong the condemned suffering. The guards would lay the prisoner on the ice and douse them with their own warm golden showers so hyperthermia would take longer to settle in and end the poor victim. It was gross and it was humiliating. What happened behind the closed walls of the Gulag usually stayed secret within the Gulag, but long after the Gulags became a thing of the past, some unfortunate souls who were part of the ordeal and survived to tell the tale dare to recall the atrocities. Danzig Baldev, a retired Soviet prison guard, shed light on the dark secrets of exploitations in the Gulag in his book Drawings from the Gulag. The most chilling account was about the double standards of the Soviet code of humanism. While NKVD was known for their sadistic approach and playing the parts of judge, jury, and executioner, they would deliver their own brand of punishment by beating, public humiliation, extortion, etc., all of which violate the sanctity of humanity. And ironically, they had a Soviet law of humanism. According to the laws of Soviet humanism, only those who had a normal body temperature of 96 degrees Fahrenheit to 99 degrees Fahrenheit could be shot. So the only time Gulag guards would grow a conscience and treat a prisoner humanely was when they needed them to be fit enough to be shot down by the firing squad. It was no different than feeding a turkey before slaughtering it on Thanksgiving Day. Of course, as the Gulag was mostly the designated residential address of those who had rebellious ideas of individuality, social welfare, and liberty, not every prisoner was happy about being treated to health only to be put down to death. Such inmates found it difficult to curb their rebelling spirit and would continue to protest inside the Gulag as well. For example, the hunger strike was a popular method of protest among such prisoners whose health would deteriorate, making themselves hard pills to swallow for the Gulag authorities. To break their hunger strike, Gulag authorities would often resort to using excessive force. If beating and breaking their bones or threatening their family proved insufficient, these on-strike prisoners were forcefully fed through their nostrils while they kicked and screamed in protest. The feeding was just enough to bring their vitals back to normal, making them eligible for punishment. During Stalin's great purges, he tried to remove every person from the Soviet regime who could and were voicing dissent at his leadership or posing a threat to it. The rich peasants called kulaks, opposing members of the Communist Party, military officers and government officials were sent to the Gulag if not terminated. Even educated people and ordinary citizens like doctors, writers, intellects, students, artists and scientists were designated the same fate by Stalin's regime to either die quickly on the spot or live an excruciating life in the gulag. 
Within a short span of two years, some 750,000 people were executed on the spot. One million more were sent to the gulags. Soviet intelligence agencies had their own process of trying these suspected counter-revolutionaries and anti-Soviet activists. The judgment was passed first, then they were arrested, followed by the punishment, and then they were tried after making sure the victim had broken down to make a confession. NKVD staff used brutal punishment where victims were stripped of their bottoms and forced to sit down with their bare rear on top of a heated bucket full of rats trying to escape. Vasily Kovalyev, who was one of the rare group of people to survive the gulag, also mentioned how hungry dogs were released on them during investigations just for the authorities' fun. People labeled as the enemy of the state could also be forced unofficially to be drowned in parasha, a barrel full of human excrements. Many times during investigations, the victim's head was wrapped with a rubber bag, which made them bleed through the mouth, nose, and ears. The Soviet regime under Stalin also didn't shy away from using medieval methods such as strapado. Women prisoners of the gulags were stripped down during their checkup following their arrival at the gulag so authorities could have a good look at them. Those women who were chosen by authorities as their personal slaves were offered less harsh labor work if they agreed to oblige to the demands and whims of the authority that approached them. It was also mandatory to have women stripped during interrogation to inflict psychological trauma as authorities would humiliate and degrade them. Women who were not picked up by any authority to be their personal slaves were sent to do the harsh work of digging and logging, only to die of exhaustion and starvation. Entire families were arrested to get a confession for one person, and they were forced to watch as authorities took turns to punish their family members. They would also threaten to send the women of the family to the cells of criminals and lowlifes, where their integrity would be endangered. Those women who denied the offer to be the personal slave of authority had the worst fate waiting for them. These young women would be thrown to the dangerous anthills or would be tied to the tree so ants and other insects could eat them alive. They were also bound in compromising positions for additional humiliation. The grossest part of this tragedy is that it was often female authorities that would carry out this punishment. Women were also traded as commodities by guards, and there was a high demand for women of foreign birth, mainly Germany, Poland, and from Baltic states. The customers were the criminal kingpins who were treated better in the gulags than the enemy of the state political prisoners. It was common for such kingpin criminals to own two to three women. Victims were expected to leave their humanity outside on arriving at the gates of gulags. The new arrivals were dressed as septics and were watered down with a fire hose from the guard tower. Now mind you, the temperature would be around minus 30 degrees to minus 40 degrees Celsius. The water would freeze on the bodies of fresh prisoners. Then they were forced to wait a long time before they would be admitted inside. In the forced labor camps, conditions were brutal. Prisoners were barely fed. Stories even came out saying the inmates had been caught hunting rats and wild dogs, snagging any living thing they could find for something to eat. Vasily Kovalyuv was trapped in mines in the Russian Arctic as guards blocked all the entrances with grills. Kovalyuv and other miners had to spend five months underground with food that only lasted three months, and they had to survive the rest of the days chewing wood shavings. Sleep deprivation was quite popular among all gulags, and cells at certain prisons were constructed with sloped floors. Guards could fill them with ice water whenever the prisoners would fall asleep to keep them awake. They would also prohibit prisoners from sitting down and were forced to walk up and down the cell to keep them from sleeping. Many prisoners would take a step, fall asleep, take another, and lose their balance, awaken and catch themselves and turn around to repeat the process. According to inmates who survived the ordeal and were released after Stalin's death by his successor, Nikita Khrushchev, there were a total of 52 kinds of punishment methods and devices implemented by the authorities at gulags. From Sukhanovka Swallow to Taylor Boilers, these prisons were pits of incessant punishment. We would hope for these punishments to have been forgotten, but the rival counterpart of NKVD picked up most of these methods and introduced them in the West where they became standard procedure for intelligence punishments in the following decades. Tell us in the comments, what other period would you like us to cover in this series? And as always, thanks for watching Nutty History.